Okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's my distinct honor to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Tongchai Wenichukun. He's an emeritus professor of history at the University of Wisconsin Madison, a research fellow emeritus at the Institute of the Developing Economies in Japan, and currently a visiting professor of the Pridi Panomyang International College in Thammasat University in Thailand. His first book, Siam Mapped, A History of the Geobody of a Nation, was uh, awarded the, by the Association for Asian Studies, uh, the Harry Benda Prize, and the Grand Prize from the Asian Affairs Research Council of Japan, and was translated into Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Thai. In today's talk, Moments of Silence in Modern Thai History, the unforgetting of October 6, 1976, Dr. Tong Chai will talk about his latest book, which was recently awarded the Humanities Book Prize by the European Association for Southeast Asian Studies in 2022, and the Association for Asian Studies George Cahan Book Prize in 2023. He received the John Simon Guggenheim Award in 1994, and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2003. He then served as president of the Association for Asian Studies in 2013 and 2014. His research concerns the intellectual foundations of modern Siam under colonial conditions, modern geography and sovereignty, historical ideology, and the Thai legal system. He has published eight books in Thai and several articles and is well, a well-known critic of Thai political and social issues. Now please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Tong Chai. Uh, it's an honor, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been to the Capitol, to DC Capitol building as a tourist a few times, have been coming to DC to give a talk, mostly for business, giving a talk, meeting people, and then fly out. <laughs> this is a, the last time I came here in 2018 briefly from, from Asia. Then before that, many more years before that, I think mainly by the years. The only time I have time to enjoy, really enjoy DC when I took my kids uh, to travel around here. Now my kids have kids, so it must mean <laughs> so many years. Anyway, my interest in the map, in a way, not faded away, but I turn my, uh, that, that, uh, that the kind of, uh, many people are like me, turn the interest to something else. I turn to history, look at literature, look at other things. Uh, then also something in my mind about the book that came out in 2020, right before the pandemic, the book came out. So not many places to go around to talk, <laughs> but let's say, uh, have a chance. It's important uh, subject that has been on the back of my mind throughout my career, even though I'm my interest in map and other things. In a way, you might say that I'm not going to, to, to explain in what ways. My interest in the map and that even the map book is, is a kind of, is a kind of response to the massacre. In what ways, I'm not going to explain a bit long, a bit zigzag. So when I have a chance to concentrate, I have collected uh, evidence, materials, data for about 20 years, long time. When I have a chance, I thought that I almost unable to write another book. So I made a good decision. I look, look back, it's a good decision. I, I made a decision to retire because I want to write this book. It's done. Now, I, I, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with retirement. I don't miss at all because otherwise I won't finish this book. And after this, this book finished, I have more time to turn to legal history and now I am back to map. 
part of the reason coming to DC is to hear geography and map section. To do what? To look at maps. I just told Harold this morning, I spent almost an hour figuring out why the white pen that collect the lines of the map that they draw incorrectly, uh, about five of them bleed to the other side, one of them didn't bleed. So the whole time, the whole hour, thinking about why it didn't bleed. <laughs> Then I realized it's irrelevant. But then I'm so happy to do things that irrelevance again. It's it's a kind of the world that we live with. So much we have to engage with serious things. So much we should find time to dealing with the irrelevance because that's how we live. The massacre took place at the peak of the domestic Cold War in Thailand. After the socialist or communist revolution in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos in 1975, many predicted that Thailand to, would be the next domino to fall. And in Thailand, in the wake of the popular uprising in 1973, that ended the long military rule since 1947, the student movement turned radicalized and expanded rapidly, not only among intellectuals, but among workers and peasants in many parts of the country. And although the radical did not advocate violent insurrections in the cities, they demanded radical changes in Thai society from top to bottom, demand from democracy to social and economic justice and equality. The establishment in Thailand, those in power, mainly the military and the palace, were frightened by these commies who were not only in the neighbors, but right in their home. To them, to the establishment, Especially the military in the palace, communism was not a radical political economic ideology. It was not an alternative to capitalism. For Thailand, especially the elite, communism was an evil from foreign countries and a foreign ideology that tried to destroy the Thai nation, Buddhism, and the monarchy. The three pillars that constitute the Thai nation. A militant right-wing movement was formed. Many parts of that wing, but become a movement, was formed to counter the leftists. The right-wing movement was supported by the military and palace openly. Its main ideology, to put it in a nutshell, was that communists would destroy the Thai nation, Buddhism, and monarchy. Therefore, Thai patriots must fight to protect the country. The right wing turned hateful, turned threatening, and turned more violent, including physical attack, armed counter movement, assassinations. About 50 people were assassinated one by one before half, half a year, almost a year before the massacre. Many people gone missing, disappearance until today. Finally, the massacre, for the sake of protecting the nation, Buddhism, and the monarchy. I'm just showing you the pictures. I'm not going to talk much. The pretext of that is a hanging of two activists who put posters in protest of a return of the dictate, one of the dictators who escaped the country in 1973. So I'll put it again in the chronological order. A dictator who escaped from the country, fled the country in 1973, returned in October, in late September 1976. These two, they are not students, they are worker, unionist workers, put out the poster in protest. Then in one morning, they were found hanged brutally with the mark of the handcuff. Five police were arrested on the 5th of October, but since 
The massacre took place on October 6th. Nobody knows about the case of arresting those five police anymore. Okay, but then, follow the story. This happened and then, Thomas our students play a skit as a protest of those two, of the hanging of those two people. The next day, the right-wing newspaper published the picture telling the public that the face of the person in the skit looked like the crown prince. I put that picture to, for you to look at. The crown prince is the current king, Rama X. With that, it's a pretext. The, the right-wing newspaper distributed that uh, you can say a newspaper, you can uh, say a leaflet. Uh, this is not sarcastic because now newspapers have many pages, right? But that newspaper that published uh, the picture of the hanging and say that the, uh, the student, the leftist student, uh, threat to kill or, 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 or threaten the monarchy, they published as a one page paper, one page newspaper page and distributed it and mostly for free. So you can see a newspaper, you can see a leaflet, the same thing, on the afternoon of the October 5th. By at night, police surrounded, and in the morning, uh, they shoot the bomb, I mean the, the M79 bomb into the center of the gathering in the soccer field at Thomas Hart University. And by sunrise, they started to, the police and paramilitary right-wing groups started moving in. And this is what happened. That's my friend. We thought that, the public thought that only one because this picture has been widely distributed, not right after the, no, about 20 years later. By now it's 40, almost 48 years, right? After 20 years, this, this picture has been known, widely uh, known. But let's say in 20 years, uh, which means from 21st to about 40th years, we thought that there is, people thought there only one. For the serious people like me, I thought that uh, two people were hanged. It turned out by that year we did more research, there were altogether five people were hanged. Four burnt. This is from the picture. A lot of people seem to have pleasure, take pleasure of the hanging. And 3,000, about 3,000 people who were alive were round up, sent to prison. Overall, it's almost 48 years, but until now, since that morning, there has never been an investigation to what happened. No. Memories of the tragedy have changed. Its meanings, too, have changed. Silence about the massacre in various forms and degrees have been pervasive most of the time, especially the first 20 years after the incident. It means 1976 to 1996. By 1996, there is a breakthrough. We have the first real commemoration widely in public and the public to respond to it positively still doesn't mean it, 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 it led to any investigation. The government at the time paid no attention, didn't care. Since then, 1996 until today, people 
know more, learn more with some limit. And that's the subject of my book. What happened in the first 20 years? Why silence? What happened in the final 20 something years? Why people learn more? What condition nurture or what condition somehow keep the condition that I would call the unforgetting alive during the past 40 years? For me, silence is not forgetting. Silence is not forgetting. Silence is unforgetting in the sense that it is ability to remember but cannot articulate the memory. In other words, you might say it is difficulty to remember but difficulty to forget. It's a kind of hanging there in limbo between memory and forgetfulness. People don't forget these incidents, no, these kind of things. But as long as they cannot articulate in a kind of understandable, meaningful way, especially the public, the memory stuck in there. Not clear memory, not forget. So that's why I call it unforgetting. The inability to articulate memories in, in meaningful ways or to voice out the memories in public. Unforgetting two different people involving with the massacre at the different moments and for different reasons, not just one. As we'll see, the victims, the perpetrators, the general public, they all have different reasons to keep this memory but unable to speak it up. The ability to keep the unforgetting with them. And those reasons, those conditions among those people have changed over 40 years as well. I'm still a historian, not a kind of writing this book, not activist mode, want to revenge. No, a long time ago, I didn't seek, I didn't care about revenge. The interest for me is purely, I mean, partly history, partly, of course, the kind of con conscience that my friends have lost. I want to understand the change. In this case, the change of memories, the change of unforgetting. There are many reasons, many factors contributed to, to, to the unforgetting or to silence. In this talk, I will focus on uh, these two things. And the third one I will mention next and then pass, pass I mean, I'm not going to talk much. It, it's a subject that I'm working on, in fact, right now. The two things I focus on is the uh, uh, I call it chronopolitics of memory. This is not myself. I take it from Professor Carol Gluck. People who do Japanese history would know her. She wrote on the memory situation in Japan. He came up with the word chronopolitics of memory. The changing conditions, especially politics, that affect memories affect how we remember, affect what to forget, what to memorize, what to remember, affect how to articulate or speak it out, those memory. And the second thing I believe, as, as, as far as my research uh, tells uh, me, in Many things involve cultural ideology have contributed to, to the silence in the Thai case. I believe in many other cases too, but as far as I look at, especially in the Latin American cases, not many people, not many writers emphasize or take a serious look at the cultural factors. In this case, especially I want to emphasize, I will mention Buddhism in passing. I know it might be interesting to many people, but but I, I want to focus on the issue that I think a lot of people seem to overlook, which is history, historical knowledge itself. How historical knowledge, historical ideology contribute, contributes to unforgetting, contributes to silence. Okay, let's go for the next one first and then I won't come back to it again. There's also one slide that didn't appear in any previous talk, in case you go back and look at YouTube of my previous talk, no. The more I dig up into legal history, I realize 
how law contributes to silence to in significant way. In Thailand, it's not a rule of law. That's how I argue. Lots of people still don't want to accept that. It's not. It's not even underdeveloped rule of law. No. It's on different track. It's different kind of legal system altogether. It's a law that gives privilege to the state, especially if it's involved national security. The court also approved every coup that happened in Thailand, approved every coup's orders as valid, legitimate laws. Among those, among those orders that became valid because endorsed, approved by the court, by the judiciary, it involved giving impunity. If giving impunity to the coup makers for October 6th massacre, there were three legal, there were three legal pieces, I wouldn't call a statute because it's a different, different degree, different hierarchy of the law. There are three legal pieces that provide impunity for people who involve in the local, in the October 6th massacre. Three of them to make sure that they will be free from punishment. Anyway, I'd like to return to the subject. For the victims, you might have imagined why they want to keep silence. At first, they didn't. In the first 20 years, the only group that spoke out a lot is the victims who went to join the armed struggle with the Communist Party. They spoke through action, fighting the government forces. They spoke through their underground literature and underground uh, radio broadcast, uh, attacking the government, the Thai state, uh, heavily, seriously for about uh, some years, uh, three or four years, until the communists collapsed in early 1980s. Of course, by that time, a lot of things happened. I'm going to tell the stories. But they keep attacking the government, uh, the crime of the state, because they involved in the massacre in 1976 at Thammasat University. But as I said, the Communist Party collapsed in the early 80s. The main thing of the collapse. Part of it is because the government changed the strategy to fight communism. Instead of fighting by force, instead of torture, suppression, that caused a lot of life during the, the peak of the Cold War between the late 60s. I mean, if we count, it's from the, it started in the late 50s, but the series, the peak of it, late 60s to about, about the mid or late 70s, that's the time that a lot of people got killed, got in trouble because of the fighting. The state changed that strategy. They allow the students who joined the Communist Party to return without interrogation. A lot of people give credit to the state for changing that strategy, but the fact that that strategy changed after a number of debates struggle within the elite among the, the security, military, police, and the palace themselves, and they started with amnesty of the group in jail the group that was arrested in, uh, at, the, at the time of the massacre, right? I told you 3,000. After that, released, released by, I mean, big number until in the end, 18, 19 people were charged. I'm one of the 19 who were charged and stayed in jail for two years. The state released us by amnesty us, 19 of us in jail after the trial went on for about a year. What happened in the trial? The trial implicate the security people for attacking us and killing us, even though we did not start. It looks like the try, the long it went on, is not good for the government. It's not good for those involved. And the trial got a lot of public attention and attention from international 
uh, I mean, among diplomats and, and, and many countries. That's one time, not many times, the international pressure have worked on and successfully. October 6th case is one of them. I see all two current administration. Current administration sent send a special envoy directly to the prison. The prison changed overnight. <laughs> the condition of prison changed literally overnight. Literally overnight. And they can, of course, we cannot speak. It showed we are well treated. Of course, we are well treated from that day on. <laughs> and many more. So they released 19 of us. That's the start of the changing of the overall strategy, strategy to fight communists, including a lot of students who joined the Communist Party to return home without interrogation. By that time, what happened in the Communist Party, I spent a bit too long to give credit to the state changing strategy to, for the communist collapse. In fact, they are infighting within the Communist Party before that, before the state even released our group. In a way, I can say that it's debatable, but I would argue that. The state find the opportunity to change the strategy partly because they saw the opportunity by the communists in fighting to the, to the extent that they almost got to mutiny in many communist camps. Between who and who? Mainly between the new generation, new blood, between the students who went into the jungle and the old gods. They belong to a different world, different generations. They think, they thought differently, they saw Thailand in many ways, even though both are dissatisfied with Thailand that they witness, even though the young blood, the new blood, are witness the massacre at the end, but they don't see the same thing as the old guard, especially they don't see this, they don't, they are not satisfied with the fact that the old guards of the Communist Party follow China too closely, dogmatically. So there were conflict with the communist basis, almost to the point of mutiny. And people started to return before the government released us. So the government find the opportunity, then issue a decree, allow people to come back. A lot of people return. If you are the victims who have scolded on air and in action, the government are brutal, killing us, killing our friends, then you have to come back. What would you feel? For many, the main reason they went to jungle is to take revenge. For the death of their friends in the massacre. It means that they have to come back. It means that they were defeated again. Remember this song? This song was written, I know, they don't, they don't know my, I mean, they don't know the situation in Thailand. But literally, the lyrics of the song, people who have gone through the massacre, we feel that the lyric is as if, was written as if written for October 6th massacre. There were really chairs and tables, really, literally chairs and tables. People who die at the chairs at the tables put those chairs and tables to block the police bullet, to block the police from coming in. There were bodies there. Many of my friends return home with that feeling. And you know the movie, you know the musical Les Miserables, when they sing this song. Imagine, the song was sung at the moment when one of the protagonists, the guy, returned to the scene of the killing, right? Found blood, 
found remnants of things on the floor in a room in Tamasa Massacre would be in the soccer field, and he started to sing this song. Remember what he felt in Le Miserable. That similar feeling. Feeling of emptiness. After years of dedicating to radical purposes, for what? After years going, bearing arms to fight the, com fight the state, for what? And those for what? Have bodies laid on the ground, have people died? Not only enemies, I mean the soldiers, but their own friends, our friends. But then we have to return in the defeat. Nobody wanted to talk about October 6 anymore. Among the perpetrators, they brag about killings for about a year. If you go to look at newspaper, one year after the massacre, they bragged. They saved the country from being taken over by the communists. They saved the monarchy. Because otherwise, the communists would take over and, and abolish and killing all royal families. They bragged. But things have changed. The same politics that I have explained, the changing strategy of the, of the state, they started their kind of, I don't know the operation of the, of the state. There must be some kind of signal or some kind of, if not uh, order or directive for the right wing people to shut up. After a year, those kind of backing, those kind of voices faded away including this, among the right wing, as I said, supported openly by the military. I wrote in the book, explain quite a bit. I have to say that it's my hypothesis who are this right wing. Uh, I'm pretty sure, even though it's hard to get the evidence, mainly in one of main wing is a palace. I put that aside, not only for my own safety, partly because it's separate from the, the other wing. The other way is the military. The military operated by Internal Security Operation Command, or the acronym is ISOC, the main agency for national security until today. It started from Internal Security, Anti-Communist Security Operation Command, something starting from the Cold War and Thai communists to internal security, to operate until nowadays with the tax money, with the secret budget. The ISOC organized into three branches, such as this guy uh, controlled paramilitary to attack students from time to time, and this guy uh, become a mercenary forces, a small group, of, uh, I would say, like in, 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 in the book I call the goon, but uh, I'm not sure it's the right word, but I, that's the best I can come up. More like a right-wing paramilitary, paramilitary vigilante. People in this group are the real perpetrators who kill. Not my hypothesis or my gesture. He told me with pride. Yeah, part of the book, I interviewed this guy. I interviewed this guy too. He served under ISOC. He's a, a, a Navy commander under ISOC. The previous guy is Army commander under ISOC, under uh, uh, security. This guy organized the, the civilian group, paramilitary, paramilitary group, most are gangster, and employed people. <coughs> In the Marxist term, they would call lumpen proletariat. In the normal term, we would call vigilante, call goons, whatever. But people of this group are the real killer. And he told me with pride. He even ridiculed the previous group. 
because a few people of the, of the previous group came to join the interview. This guy laughed at the first group. You guys are not the real man because you are afraid of taking action. Only this group, not afraid. When I dig deeper asking him about in what ways I saw involved, he shut up. He bragged about what he did, but he shut up right away once asking about how it worked. At the time, I assured him, I have no revenge, nothing. I'm not going even to write. If you don't want to, you can put in writing which part is okay, which part is not. I do properly according to protocol for academic research. But apart from that, I just want to know. So until today, I just know that I saw is behind this group. I just didn't know clearly in what ways. I met a few other people who mentioned the meeting among these people. Same thing. They slipped to me that there's a meeting here and there a few times. There are more than that. They slipped to me, mentioned the time meeting here and there. Once it go deeper, no, they shut up. So that's how I can, I can tell about the, this right wing group. But anyway, the more important thing you know, right wing is things have changed, politics have changed. By the time I interviewed them in early 2000, I, I made a re serious research for interview right wing between 2001, 2000 to 2001, and again in 2005 to talk to these right wing people. By that time, it's gone way, way beyond the, the amnesty in the late 70s, release of my group in the late 70s, beyond the Cold War, beyond the collapse of Communist Party in 1981. And Thailand moved on to semi-democracy, moved on to elected uh, the democracy. This is, long, this is before 2006 coup, right? Before the latest two uh, coups in Thailand. So that time, uh, before and, tuck, and including Thaksin period, is more like a, I would call, relatively speaking, the more democratic, more freedom to talk about that, more concerned about human rights. That atmosphere, this group have gone into silence. They cannot brag anymore. Only this group, the guy I mentioned, the Navy commander, brag about it, but they complain. Every group complain that people nowadays, means early 2000, did not realize how much they owe to them. I mean, how people owe to them that they have protecting the country. No remorse. One group bragged, other group didn't brag, but they involved in the violence, not real killing on that morning, such as the first army commander involved in the paramilitary violence against the student demonstration so many times before the massacre. But on that morning, for Thai people or people who are interested in Thailand, you might have heard the Red Gore. According to my research, Red Gore did not involve in the real killing that morning. The person who involved, you don't ask me about the name of the group because the group has no name. The group that has the name, the Red Corps, they do many violence before the massacre. But on that day, they did not, they, was, they were not part of the plan. They withdrew to their headquarters. So all of them, different kind, different shades of the perpetrators, none of them feel they did something wrong. None of them feel remorse. Brag or not brag, that's a difference. But all of them kept pride or kept their anger, anger, anger at the public, anger at the state that they didn't recognize their, their contribution, kept in silence. They didn't want to talk either. For the public, there are quite a number of public who didn't want to speak either. Why? First of all, many of the public, the public who didn't know what's going on. Yes, a lot of people didn't know what was going on. I forget to say that, to tell that. Because right after the massacre, on that day, the massacre took place in the morning. All the TV and radio stay broadcast. Bad time, there's no 
internet, no social media, only TV and radio broadcast. All radio broadcast has been under control of the military before the massacre took place for the reason of security. Only a few TV channels and radio broadcasts under the public relations department by the civilian government at the time. They are afraid of doing anything, yet not under control. By the time the massacre took place, the military took control 100%. What news going to be released? What story, what information going to be, going to be told to public at large all over the country? It means that a lot of people before 1996, they heard about the massacre in Bangkok, but they didn't really know it. Or they heard a killing. Yes, there's newspaper, but it's framed in the sense of there are protests, that there are riots, there are unrest, and, and the government, especially the military who stayed to coup in the evening of, or of, in the evening, a few hours after the massacre, they are able to take control and return, I mean, bring the situation into, into peace and into order again. So most people realize something happened in Bangkok, but they didn't realize what happened. They thought that unrest, a few people killed, by that time, is not unusual. They didn't know the scale. They didn't know the brutality. People realize about brutality through rumors Little bit, little bit by bit by bit until 1996 exploded, become a common knowledge. So, how about people who are politically conscious, politically care? They know it. I mean, not the victim, not the perpetrators, they know it. But they didn't want to speak either. Why? I have interviewed a few newspaper editors at the time. I interviewed later, newspaper editor at the time, who later became whatever, I interviewed them around early 2002. Why they kept quiet? Why they didn't speak out? Most of them sympathetic to students, but they didn't want to talk. Why? Fear, yes, of course. What else? They're afraid of even hinting at the false, the implication of the palace, not just fear, it would cause unimaginable repercussion and they didn't want that. Understandable? Yes. Not in the sense of, I mean, who would say, I want justice to extend the world happy, I don't care. And this is not from the victim viewpoint, not from the, from the leftist viewpoint. Just typical, ordinary, intellectual, I mean, educated people, they're afraid of talking implication with a two major institutions of the country, the palace and the, and the sangha, the Buddhist order they could not imagine what would be the repercussion. So they kept quiet. What else? The government campaign for the release of my group, this is the group, 19 people, on the day of the release. The call for reconciliation. This one too, this reason too, a lot of people agree. They know that it's not fair, it's not justice, but at least return, to some extent, return to normalcy. Agree or not, like it or not, it happened. Reconciliation has worked so well in the first 20 years. There are a few people, I'm going to mention this in passing, such as this Buddhist monk, 
He's a friend of mine. He was in jail too for a few days. He was arrested from that morning. At the time, he wasn't among his mind. He's my real, his old friend from high school to history, studying history together. Second year, same year, we are in the same class. Later, he became a monk, and still now, he's one of the most respected monk in the country. Uh, he's an intellectual monk, wrote a lot of books. He explained to me, this is not, this is not, uh, this, I chose his, 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 his picture not because he completely agreed that we should, no, he disagreed, we should keep silence, but he explained to me, thinking in typical Buddhism, Buddhist, how would they think? <laughs> he have explained a lot of people would think about this. I let you read. Sorry if it's not clear. The brutality was a manifestation of the evil that's always ready to dress up in any ideological and religious garb in order to fulfill its wish. Ultimately speaking, the October 6th event sorry, was a struggle between the evil and the virtue. The battlefield was not the actual place, Tamasat or whatever. It is in our mind. Sounds familiar? If you're not familiar enough, study, look at thinking of some people, not all, not maybe not even majority, of people respond to me like incident during the Vietnam War. In the Buddhist, serious Buddhist thinking, it's not to seek justice to bring those perpetrators to justice because the real perpetrator is the evil. Even for my friend, I showed you the picture a moment ago for him, the first priority is to fight that evil, even though he doesn't mind if the perpetrator would be brought to, would be brought to, 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 to justice, normal justice as we know it, retributive justice. But for a lot of people, then they ask him, is that the thinking? Because for people who feel that they have no way to find, to seek justice, normal justice, because every door of October 6th has been shut. He agrees that it's possible. It's just an escape argument, escape excuse, uh, because they can't do retributive justice. But he only argued that this is serious. This is the real thing, typical Buddhist would come to this conclusion, not too difficult. Only the, the kind of stubborn, maybe not too Buddhist like me, like many people, I may not see this as a real, as a serious uh, argument. For many people, he argued that many people, this kind of thing can be taken seriously instead of retributive justice. So result is silent. A lot of people, not the perpetrators, not the elite, not the military, did not agree with me even to find, to dig out what the fact, what are the truth, what happened because of this. Because history, fact, and truth is the bottom line, is the first step for retributive justice. You cannot avoid it. So they prefer shutting down that channel too don't go to seek history. But the real thing that is uh, not many people have talked about among the studies of massacre and violence, atrocities, is the cultural factors. I put Buddhism, I put reconciliation, I put a number of things a moment ago, I want to focus on this. I think history contributes to killing, and history contributes to forgetting. History contributes to unforgetting. How? This may not be every history, but I would uh, explain this way. <clears throat> For Thailand, History in Thai cultural context 
history, historical knowledge in Thai cultural context. By the way, history in every culture is not just seeking the truth of, of the past. It's not talking about change. Many history is not about change. Many history is a kind of ideology. When you talk about uh, you are Marxist, you are Fuku, Fu, Francis Fukuyama, if you talk about whoever, when you talk about history in the future, what is that history in the future? It means that history is not about the past, right? History more is like a trajectory of change over time from the past, but for many people, including to the future as well. Either you talk about will of history, history, history in Marxist term, or you talk about history in the future, there will be no, there will be only liberal democracy like Francis Fukuyama, or many other people who talk about history in the future, future tense. That history doesn't mean the past. And that history is one step close to what I would call historical ideology. When we talk about history, it's not just finding the fact about the past. Argument, debating, establishing what is true, what is not. It's a belief that the past tells us, inform us the trajectory into the future. But all of that, don't you think, all of that, all, whatever kind of historian you think about, involves certain kind of ideology. For historians, we know this for, some, for quite a while. We don't deny it. It involves, historical ideology involved in the framing of the way we interpret the past. We select or we believe some evidence more or less. I'm not talking about bad historian who intentionally distort, who intentionally fake or fabricate history. I'm talking about even good historian conservative, liberal, left or right, they cannot avoid bias. We cannot avoid biases. We put in our head, it works when we do our work. It produces certain evidence more obvious than others. It involves in the interpretation leading to conclusion. If we are a historian that talk about the future, it involves how we see the past and see the trajectory into the future. All involve historical ideology. So I'm going, I have said this because I want to say that Thailand is not that bad, it's not that different, it's just a bit too much. <laughs> Histor history in Thai context. It's not necessarily the interpretive knowledge to explain what actually happened in the past and changes over time. Rather, it is primarily the story about the past that confirms the normative truth. It is supposed to be the correct according to the normative truth. Normative such as Thai nation is glorious. If you say Thai nation sucks, you must learn something wrong in history. If you say Thai monarch is not as good as we believe, then you are in trouble because history confirms Thai monarchy has always been good. If you, if you say such and such and such and such and such, you see, historical ideology came first, framed and dictated the way people believe. In Thai history, the main story for the past hundred something years, main story, I don't mean the only story. There are other stories, but the main, the convention, the main story, you can find in the street, you find mainly in the textbook, because textbook you can, you can control. In the public, you can control some, you can't some, but mainly on TV, on any media, not just the state, ordinary people usually, typically believe that the country has been saved time after time, thanks to great monarchs. They believe the country has prospered up to this point. Of course, with ups and downs, with a few bad monarchs, but generally speaking, thanks to the monarchy. In the wider Asian culture, Asian countries, including Thailand, especially Thailand, 
if you tell them Lord Acton's famous word, uh, phrase, power corrupts, right? Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. In fact, that, does, that doesn't go along with Buddhist political philosophy well. Because in Buddhism, people who got more power, it reflects the high merit in the past. It means that high merit is virtuous. It means the ruler is virtuous. It means the state is among the highest virtue in the world. Have you heard that? The Buddha, when he was born, there were predictions. He would be either the Buddha or he would be the emperor, right? How come both can go to the same baby? Because both reflect the same level of merit, right? That theory, in theory, things have changed, people have changed, we become too contaminated by Western ideas, learn a lot more about Acton's words. We believe, like everybody else in the world, that power corrupts. But deep down, that culture hasn't died away. They believe that the state is virtuous. Thai history explains time after time how the state has been good, benevolent, has brought things back to normalcy as long as we keep the country, we keep the society in good social order. But then, how could you interpret what is a normal social order? That's why the Ku group in Thailand, every Ku group, they would cite three reasons. There are more than three, but mainly three reasons. One, national security. Two, return the society into normal social order. Three, because the government that was ousted caused trouble, deterioration in public morality. All about Buddhist social order. That's why in Thai history, a state massacre, a state crime killing a lot of people. They know the state caused violence many times in the past, but all of them in history book would be framed in the sense that those are necessary actions against the evil. Those are necessary actions against the bad guys. So it's not automatically, it's not automatic for people when heard about disturbances, heard about suppression, heard about violence in Bangkok, it's not automatic they would think, oh, the state did it again. No, it's the opposite. There must be something happened and the state need the state necessary to bring the force to return to normalcy. October 6th has been framed in that way for a long time. With or regardless of the backing by the right wing, there must be something wrong about us. That's why the state has to intervene, has to use the force. Of course, people didn't see the picture. People didn't see how brutal it was until years later. And of course, when they saw that, they realized this is not right. This is not bring peace and order, return to normalcy. That's the power of photography that happened. I'm not going to into that, but let's say many people have studied particularly on this aspect the power of pictures and photography in October 6th massacre because it breaks down a lot of conventional assumption about the Thai state. The Thai state wouldn't be brutal. The Thai, Thai state wouldn't be violent. They all, they usually necessarily bring force, necessary to bring back order and peace to the society, so on and so forth, especially the palace. It's hard for people to believe the palace has anything to do with this, even today. And that's the ceiling. The ceiling, I'm going to talk, I'm going to back to mention to that. I'm going to end within five minutes, sorry, to a bit above the time. And that's why, by the way, in Thailand, control of memory has been very important. I try to suggest many times to tell people that in a way, Thailand, North Korea, even, even much further, is 
to the extreme. But country like Thailand, I believe many other countries too, we can study it as a kind of variation of Orwellian society. People, people may not believe. I don't think it's controlled like North Korea, no, 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 but there are ways to try to control memory, to control history. And they did that in Thailand. Like a, a few pictures they show here, I didn't have time. Just two years ago, students in the southern Thailand, in Patani, produced a board game telling the story from Patani viewpoint. They were arrested. And the military issued order right away to set up a committee. They didn't call committee to control history, they called committee to distribute the correct history. <laughs> this is it. They do that all the time. Why history is so important? They arrest the student, they charge the students because of board games. Many more. All we can do is memory projects such as this. In 1996, we were able to break through. People know it with limit. Since then, there were commemorations every year. It's pretty big. Especially the past uh, three or four years, I'm going to tell them in, for the last slides, it's become huge. Most of the time, still organized by people my, my generation, I mean, the previous victims. After 20 years, part of success is that by that time, the former victims are not afraid of speaking out anymore. That part I skip in the talk, but I explain in the book what happened in the 1996 around that time. Again, chronopolitics, memory, things have changed. By that time, former victims who feel empty, who, are, who didn't want to talk about the sacrifice of friends for nothing, they kind of... Uh, able to get back, get together, and organize a commemoration the first time in 1996, and every year after that. Oops, sorry. And for example, this one, you can see that, doc6.com. We started, uh, we, I call we because I'm part of it, in, by the 40th anniversary, mean, uh, not long ago, 2019. 19, to create. Now I put everything, I, 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 do, I did my research, plus more than I did my research on this website is the database, online database. There is no actual place where documents were stored because we know that if we do that, maybe documents will be plundered and gone. I have document, I scan every page, I did my research and then put it up and then a team of uh, friends uh, scan every page of uh, as many as newspaper we can find in the whole 19, uh, uh, 1976 from January until October 6, because many newspaper cut short, closed. The government closed the shut down newspaper after that day. We scan every page, including advertisement, including gossip about movie star, every page of many newspaper onto that and many more. Interview of victims, family of victims. One third, we cannot track them down. One third, we track them down. They refuse to say anything because it's interesting. Their response is almost identical. It's still a sensitive issue. In time, it been but then like yet on. They almost say the same the same word like it on, sensitive. What does it mean, sensitive? Again, keep that for the final slides. Only one third we are able to uh, have them agree to video recording. You can log into that and, and there's no need to log in, you can click into that and then you can see many pictures, many photos, and also record your interview. And also this one, I'd like to return very briefly. Don't assume that all silence are bad. This is a case of one family. I believe a lot of people who kept silence could be for this reason, for good reason. 
So even though I myself am against injustice, I want to bring those perpetrators justice. I'm against silence, blah, 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 blah. Once you get to this, I realize I was wrong. Sometimes silence is good. This family tried to search his body because he threw his idea away. His body was found but unidentified. He become one of the male who are unidentified all 20 years. He was tortured to the, his face doesn't look the same. I first recognized him because I know his dress that day. I can identify even down to the, what you call the belt, sometimes they have the, University, right? Yeah, I, he liked that bell, I know him. We know that body is this guy, but we are afraid of going down to tell their parents because their parents believe that he is still alive throughout those 20 years. Their parents believe that he joined the Communist Party their parents are not communists, but they're happy when they heard the news about communists. One defeated the military there and here. They feel sad every time they heard the communists were killed because they don't know who are their, their son or not, because they believe their son is still alive. So we know before their parents, none of us have a gut to go down to tell them for 20 years. Finally, we told them. With all the pictures and all the evidence going down to their hometown in the southern Thailand, tell them. The father gave us a memoir. That he took a memoir for a few months every day after that. He traveled back and forth between down south and Bangkok go hospital, go hospital, go police stations, go here and there to try to search for his son. In the end, he, the final note is among the things that he went to many military camps in his area, in his, around his hometown, to distribute the picture of his son. If you see this guy, don't kill him, don't kill him. He was my son, was my son. And the memo stopped. After I told him, he came up to, not I, my friend told him I didn't go down south. I was in Madison. When I joined the commemoration in 1996, I met him the first time. I made a horrible question. Why you stop the memoir there? Why don't you continue? He didn't answer. He just, I realized something wrong. I answered the wrong question. Years later, a few years later, early 2000, when I started this project now, seriously, interview, among other things, interviews, left, right wing, interview, left wing, among other things, track down what happened to, this to, to, to my friends, to their son's body, in order to tell their father. Because after four, after all along, he kind of believed, they kind of believe us, but they said that as long as they did not know about the body, they still have hope that his, their son is still alive. This is it. Don't you think the end of memoir without anything is a form of silence? Don't you think that form of silence because he want to suspend in freeze the time to keep the hope alive. He couldn't find his body, then put his body in silence at the end of memoir. Don't do any memoir further. Keep distributing the pictures so there is some hope as long as we don't tell, we don't come back to the world that the truth is that that person has died. So I tracked down until I know every detail 
about his body, about autopsy, about the person, the doctor who did the autopsy, about the body, where he was cremated, on what day, at what temple. I tracked down all the truth, and one day I told them, Can you imagine? I broke their hope. I realized at the moment I told you it's me. Sorry. It's me who bring the bad news. Tell them and since then I never see them again. I can't bear myself to them. A lot of people perhaps gone to silence for this reason. As long as they have hope, maybe not for their son, maybe for society, maybe for this, for that, I can't imagine, but maybe they choose to keep silence. You can disagree, I can disagree. I can say that bringing justice is the best things in the world. Are you sure? I still believe that, but I'm not saying that it's 100% sure. Can you say that providing retributive justice and then will things that, what you say, nunca mas in, Latin, in Spanish, in Latin America, they always say that, never again. Are you sure it's never again? My friend who is a monk, who is the one who challenged me, Tong Chai, are you sure that say never again means there is, will be never, really never a massacre again? Who can guarantee? I still believe that justice is the best option. But for a lot of people who cannot trust, who fight, who disillusion with justice, we in Thailand, a lot of people are like that, right? Maybe they opt for silence according to Buddhism. Maybe they opt for silence because of this. Keep, keep hope in one way or another. But I didn't bring it up. In this particular case, all I explain to you is my interpretation. Read the book. It's their reaction. He stared at me. They cried. They, at the end, I didn't tell you it's not nice. The parents cry and scold at one another. Why didn't you see this? Why didn't you see that picture? Why didn't you tell me before? Blah, 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 blah. It's just, it's me. Ending with a positive note, in 2020, these are pictures of parents. In 2020, you know, everybody interested in Thailand have heard this movement of Jews movement in 2010. A few months after I released the book, the book came out, this happened. If I have the chance, I would write chapter 11. My books have 10 chapters. I would write chapter 11. The big the chapter 11 would begin like this. And that's the end of my talk. On August 10, 2020, at the gathering at Thammasat University to protest the palace-backed government of General Prayut Chan Ocha, the protesters show film clippings of the October 6 massacre in 1976. Thousands of people there, plus many thousand more who follow demonstration online. This is 2020 saw the brutality of uh, brutality uh, 44 is 2020 means 44 years earlier on the huge backstage LCD screen together. This gathering protest against General Prayut Chan Ocha, the coup maker of 2014. The speaker showed the pictures of so clip, film clips uh, of the October 6 massacre, brutal scenes on the screen. The clipping has been widespread since 1996. Many must have seen it before. 
But the public display this time was different. How? The marching song, soundtrack of the clipping. Because the clipping we have discovered so far is a clipping, is a recording by the military, not by us, not by foreign journalists, by military that they keep, for whatever reason, they keep the pictures of brutality, every one of them. But behind it is a marching song of the, of the army marching song. What's different is that the marching song soundtrack of the clipping was muted instead. A well-known song composed by King Pumipon was playing alongside the pictures of brutal killings. No narration, no script, no nothing. Just a song and a picture. No explanation why using the song for the clippings on the huge screen, even though they were ostensibly at odds or seemingly unrelated. After the intriguing display, a protest leader read the Ten Points Manifesto calling for the reform of the monarchy. The announcement has become a historic event for modern Thai history, for it was the beginning, for, for it was the beginning of the critical discourse on the monarchy in public that has changed Thailand forever. For some of my old friends, they shed tears to see the clippings with the songs by the monarch in the public. From 1996 to the present, I told you people know about the, the massacre already, but this limit. The limit is that we cannot say why or who. We can only say what happened, how brutal it is, and stop. We cannot say why or who or in, in the right order, who and why. It's the limit of this course on October 6th until this moment of breakthrough. I'm not sure it's breakthrough to break that limit or not. For me, it's smashing the ceiling by saying nothing, but by showing the clipping with the song. That's it. And until today, it's hard to assess how people understand the massacre 48 years ago, especially with that breakthrough moment, but with the defeat of that movement with a lot of those people, including most leaders who involved in the, in the event that I show you this. They were all charged. I think, I'm not sure the ruling came, comes already or not, but they were charged for sure. The ruling, I think it has come, they found guilty and is in the process of appeal. But on this point, I'm not sure, or maybe still on try. They're all charged for this majesty. So with this movement, but with the defeat of them at this moment, this minute, we can say that they were defeated, even though arguably what they have done is beyond defeat. It's already a breakthrough. And that's all I have to say about unforgetting 48 years after the massacre. Thank you. So I take a lot of time, but I think we have time for a few questions from. Yes. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question? Please feel free to raise your hands. We'll, we'll take questions from the audience, and then we'll take questions on Zoom. So we'll go back and forth between in person and, and the uh, Zoom audience. Yes. Regarding to you've been telling about what went wrong in Thai politics. So moving forward, if the reform was to happen, and it did change, but you still have politicians who are, what I say, power hunger, and still you know, dominated largely in the parliament by military, can change really happen? What kind of change are you talking about? Politics economic society change? If you talk a uh, broad term like that, it changes all the time. It changes doesn't mean always good, including always changing the wrong way too. 
Uh, it changes all the time. If you believe a uh, lot of people believe in gradual slow change, it changes, right? If you believe that uh, one systemic uh, overhaul like the MFP, it's also possible. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but also change. But let's say when you talk about those changes, big and small, it always happened to what you, to your satisfaction, I'm not sure. Even about October 6th, you see there are changes. To my satisfaction, depends. If you have the first assessment, first step, like people know it, yes, I'm satisfied. Breakthrough, yes, I'm satisfied. Not able, unable to bring those people perpetrated to justice. I'm not satisfied yet. But if focus on this particularly, is there a possibility to bring back the case and bring justice? I would say, in my opinion, no. No. And I have come to terms with that a long time ago. I don't expect that. Even though I still think it's the correct thing to happen. But I don't hope. I don't have hope. I kind of. If I have that kind of hope, I will be disappointed and, and feel hopeless, I become a hopeless person all my life. I don't want to be like that. It's impossible. Even more or less than that, which is end impunity, not just for October 6th case. End impunity could be less than that, could be more than that. I'm not sure. I still have hope for that, but I'm not sure. But even we can bring end impunity. I'm not sure end impunity would include October 6th case. It won't go retrospective. No, it won't. It's too late. It may be enough. So you have time enough for 2010 massacre, enough time for a number of other atrocities, but a number of them uh, may be too late already. Too late meaning maybe easier to talk, but at the same time it's very hard to establish the fact, establish who is who. A lot of them of who is who already passed away, so then there's no case. It brings back the case in the sense of make public awareness. I think this kind of political, not legal justice, political have, have brought justice to October 6th case to quite, to some extent already. Now, uh, in the nutshell, you talk about reform, but with politicians, I think oxymoron. Reform meaning reform politicians, it goes together. It goes slowly together, it goes fast together, depends how much we, we, we can change. There's not, not, not there's such a thing like reform, but still, same kind of politician and military and uh, East Thai elite, the same thing, then there would be no reform. If there's reform, it means they, they agree or they have no choice, they have to change. They, it won't stay like that. You have reform with the same people, same attitude, same mentality, no, impossible. Sorry, so do you think after all it's the people then, it's not the Thai rule of law, the Thai constitution, so it's really how the people kind of have morality to, to be in politics, to drive people agenda in, in life? Yeah, it's better. So it's what, much what better. what would you suggest to change? I, I come from Thailand. Oh, I, so I many things, back. so many things I have. It, we are not only one, one, a few minutes, maybe we need a whole course, more than a whole course to talk. What we want to talk about? I'm now studying about legal history, only law alone. I take, his, I take it seriously, study legal history, because I kept trying to tell people in the past some years, well, at least 2018, or 2000, about two, since my retirement, I turned my interest to law, to legal history, because I realized that even after you can reform politics, you can establish a kind of well-sustaining parliamentary system if you don't reform or change the law, rule of law together. No way. Impossible. They go together. Then if you go to library after this, go. It's a special library that have Thai books. Check. Compare the shelf that have books about Thai law and legal things and the books about politics. The book about politics, about parliamentary reform, about how to become democracy, is maybe five, six, maybe 10 times more than how to reform, how to make the legal system better. Thai people have just started maybe step one, questioning about their legal system. Normally, both have to go together. 
I, I, I hate to say this, but in a nutshell, no real democracy without real rule of law. No reform, one step and another together is a lockstep. That's not the way people think in Thailand. The legal system, people now, just this is the first time in the past, maybe less than 10 years, people are so upset with the legal system. This is the first time compared to how long ago we start talking about democracy. Long time ago, people trust the legal system, trust the justice system, until the past 10 years or so, they realize, oh, oh. There are a lot more to do, even the legal system alone. And I keep telling that it cannot do alone, it has to do with them, but keep focus on the legal system alone. There are a number of things that won't change easily. What I said in the past few years is that even long after Suppose Thailand can become democracy, which I tell you already, it's impossible it because it locks it. But let's say if it, if it is possible to change it to, to become democratic, it takes long, it, this is my belief, it takes longer time to fix the justice system. Justice system you cannot change by winning election. You have to change institution, which is so inert, which is so technical. It takes longer time. Thank you. And we have a question from the attendee. Um, yes. Um, so let me just reread one of them. Um, Thus, the character and dynamics of unforgetting look any different among distinct segments of the general Thai public, such as perhaps lawyers, doctors academics, teachers, journalists, monks, artists, business people, etc., either in the past or the more recent decades? This is what I believe. I say this because I have no evidence. I never do research on this. And especially I get from the impression I, I learned in the past some years, not so long ago, I, I, I went back to Thailand and more time to, in Thailand, have time to talk to people more, not just in the academic circle or in a formal activist group. I talk to a lot more people, just, just enjoy meeting and know more people. The belief I have is that Thai people like in those sectors that you mentioned, it's like everybody else in other societies. They are generally good people. In fact, if you focus on any particular profession, there are people who work hard, creative, innovative. They try to do things differently. This is what I learned. I found that every corner that I know that I happen we come to know in education, in K-12 education, in university, among the lawyers, civil, I mean, uh, you call greedy lawyers, or lawyers who care about uh, society. In every quarter, among the writers, among the artists, there are people who realize all sorts of problems. They have tried, they have done, they still do. Creative, innovative work up to limit. Limit again, yes. Up to limit. Limit is different de between, de depends on what quarters, what sectors, what profession we talk about. They try to do up to limit. For example, the sector that close more more, I mean, closer to the military, the limit is more. The sector that less close to the military, the limit is less. For example, the lawyers that do human rights things, limit is more. The lawyers that do civil cases, limit is less. This is just give you general, a general ballpark how it works. But everybody have limits, up to limits. Should we blame them for not brave enough to fight the system and get in jail. 
and sacked from the job. I wish, I wish they do that. But at the same time, I think nobody have the right to say that they should do this, they should do that. I found that the good thing is that Thai people generally much more educated than in the past, much more aware, much more intelligent, yet to put it in political action, to break through in every so many aspects in the society is not easy. The bad news is that the so-called establishment, the ruling elite, even though they change generation, change the face, they are more consolidated today. Since 2000, about 2010 or 2014, they're more consolidated than any time in Thai history. I would argue that. I would make it clear. In my opinion, the ruling elite the ruling institutions are more consolidated in the past decade or so than any time in the past. That makes it so hard to change anything. That makes it so easy for those elites such as general, prime minister, politician, to say things shamelessly, blatantly, irrational or nonsense because they don't care the consequence. That, I believe, the reason why many judicial rulings among so many cases are so out of step, are so lack of principle, are so, they violate legal principle themselves. They don't care. They just provide the result that satisfies the elite. And the elite is not just one or two people. No, 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 don't look at, don't blame, don't gossip about a few people. They are network and institutions. Altogether, they are still small, but don't think, don't think to blame only particular individuals and happy and then go home. No, it won't work that way. They become entrenched institutions because they have grown up for half a century, more than that. It's not easy. So right now is a kind of contention, quiet contention, like a, like a maybe volcano, I don't know. Don't ask me a kind of, what do you call, hot volcano about to explode or kind of cold, I don't know. I thought, I think that analogy is apt because I don't mean that it's going to explode. No, I, it can be a kind of still active, but still cold. It's a kind of unsatisfaction in every sector underneath the top. That's why you see 14 million people vote for MFP in the last election. That's a channel they can, they can explore. They can say, if you combine with 10 million of the Per Thai party, because Per Thai during the election, they campaigned for similar policy before they betray the public, the change side. If you pack together, it's about 20 million of the, of the voters. There are very little who can vote out of our four, I don't remember, over 40, 50 million, more than half. They're ready to move forward. But the consolidation, the powerful elite, some kind of able to block. And to use that word, the elite able to, it's how it looks like individual work. No, not individual. It's a kind of institutional network or people operate independently and coordinately sometimes. In general, it's an idea, ideology, and politics that the elite establishment share and then bring it to action to suppress, to replace the dissatisfaction of people all the place in many professions who are so good, so innovative, but of course, understandably, too much risk for them to try to change individually or in small groups. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we've run out of time, uh, but uh, thanks for everyone for coming today. Thank you.